It's, it's in the name, genetically modified organism. We're messing with genes. The panel we had yesterday was talking about that this hasn't really been tested over time. So to say that it's successful and that it just stops in the papaya, whatever it disrupted in the virus, that once we get into our body, that it's not gonna disrupt RNA and DNA. I mean, they talked about it yesterday. They could go in many different directions. That's the questionable thing about GMOs, is it really hasn't been out there. It really hasn't been tested. And we are the experiments. Well, I, I was on that panel, or at least one of those panels, and I completely agree with everything you've said. We really don't know, and, I, and I'll, I'll, let me see if I can rephrase the question and, and, and expand on it. So if you ask a plant geneticist whether GMOs are safe, he'll say, of course they're safe. They've been around for 25 years. People eat them every day. And that's true. People eat them every day, and they've been around for 25 years. If you take all of human history is a 24-hour clock. We've been farming, not GMO farming, farming at all for six minutes. For 23 hours and 54 minutes, human beings were hunters and gatherers. So six minutes in human history scale is the equivalent of 10,000 years. We've been farming for 10,000 years. So when someone says GMOs have been around for a long time, they're talking about 25 years as a percentage of 10,000 years, which itself is only six minutes on the scale of human history. So this idea that we, we've had it around long enough to know whether it's safe or not is ridiculous. It's a new thing. It's a nanosecond in time. 25 years in the scale of evolution, in the scale of, even in the scale of human agriculture, is nothing. It's a vanishing second. So. I'm not sympathetic with the idea that this is like an old, somehow like a fully established technology. I, it's not. So what it does to our biome, what it does to the environment, the, we will not know for a very long time. It's like people saying it's impossible that human beings are creating climate change. I mean, that's ludicrous on its face when you start to think about how, in, in the scale of history, how many years we've been using you know, cranking this carbon into the atmosphere, it's like it's at a, at a historically unprecedented scale. So we just have no idea. We don't know what the implications are. All we know is what the science is beginning to tell us. So, so I think you're correct to be very skeptical about, about this. Go ahead. Getting to the uh, papaya example, um, I have a slightly different question regarding GMOs in that situation. Um, the GMO is a technological solution to a very biological problem. <clears throat> and, and the problem is that when we apply that tool, we then forget that there was a problem, uh -huh. right? And so the virus that was causing the problem, it ceases to exist, so it's not a problem anymore. But why was the virus a problem is the question that wasn't answered. And since the viruses are probably transmitted, I'm guessing, by fruit flies, and the fruit fly population was therefore in some ways out of balance. <clears throat> it really seems to me the question should be more about now that we've got that temporary solution, how can we get back to a more permanent situation where we have a healthier environment? And has anything like that been done, particularly in the Hawaiian system, which is a very good system for studying that sort of thing? I mean, I think that's, that's a really good and deep question. Uh, and this weirdly brings me back to the questions that are brought up in things like Taoism where the, the question is how is the system itself functioning? Is the system itself in balance? Because systems that are in balance tend to constantly re-regulate themselves. I thought the way you were going to ask that question was that, uh, and I think this is also true, is that the papaya problem, like any agricultural problem, is often a function of, of the monoculture phenomenon itself. So, you know, one thing to think about is uh, the fate of the banana. Some of you know, may know this story. So every banana, unless you've been in Costa Rica, the, every banana you've ever eaten almost anywhere on the planet is one kind of banana. It's known as the Cavendish banana. So in other words, and the reason for that is because Cavendish bananas they have a nice big thick skin. They can be cut green, put on a ship, and sent around the world, and they arrive green, and then they ripen either in the supermarket or on your, your, uh, your kitchen counter. So the reason we have them is because they ship, not because they're the tastiest, not because they're the most nutritious, because they ship, which is to say they plug perfectly into the industrial global distribution system for bananas. That's why they're planted 
everywhere to the exclusion of other varieties. So what happens with the banana is that, like with all plants and all organisms, other things are trying to get into it. They're trying to get in there and disrupt it. They want to eat it, whether it's a virus or a fungus or a bacteria or whatever it is. When you have only one kind of plant that all these organisms are trying to pick their defensive locks to get into, once it gets in there, it gets into all of them. So if you have a great diversity of crops and these bugs figure out a way to pick the lock of one of them, the rest of them are unaffected. But if you have one kind of crop and a bug figures out how to pick the lock, it picks the lock for all the plants. So what has happened now with bananas is there is a fungus that has, started, has figured out how to pick the lock of bananas. And so you're seeing banana plantations, especially in, in Asia right now, that are being absolutely wiped out by a fungus because they can't figure out how to protect the banana crops from this fungus. So this is a function of monoculture. And if this fungus starts jumping continent to continent to continent, we're going to have no more bananas. Because we've planted, we put all our chips in one species, and when that one species goes, that's it. It's gone. So you're here, in this case, you're having GMO, you know, genetic engineers trying to figure out how to protect this crop. And they may succeed, they may not succeed, but it's still always in the interest of industrial scale monoculture. So, you know, the ecosystem of bananas is in no way a natural system. It's like plant one thing over and over and over and over again because it works for industry. That's not the way, you know, nature doesn't wake up one day and say, I know, let's just have one kind of banana all over the world. It doesn't function that way. It functions in a way that is always defaults to diversity and integration. So no matter what we're talking about with ge genetic engineering, it always seems to be in the service of the, of the industrial process, not in the service of natural equilibrium and balance, which is what makes me always suspicious of it. Yeah. Is, is there a correlation between the timing of um, Dow, Pioneer, Syngenta doing their experiments over on Kauai and uh, the blight with the papayas? Was there a correlation in that time span? Um, I don't think they're coral. I mean, they're, they're coincidental. I mean, so uh, the book has three chapters about three different islands, Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island. The Big Island chapter is based on this papaya story. So the papaya was going down because of the ring spot virus. I'll just tell you briefly the, each one of the stories. So on the island of Hawaii, the papaya plantation went down, and then it got re revitalized by GMOs, which might make you think that everyone on the Big Island was really pro-GMO. They aren't. Because in addition to the papaya plantation on the Big Island, there are a lot of very diverse organic farmers. It's an unbelievably great place to grow food. And I spent time with farmers on the Big Island who are really uh, anti-GMO papaya because what they're concerned about is that genetic, genetically engineered papaya will cross-pollinate with excuse me, non-genetically altered papaya and contaminate non-GMO papaya. And they don't want that. So that's happening. Meanwhile, on these other islands, Kauai and Maui, these companies are experimenting with their own GMOs, which is not papaya. It's corn and soybeans. Because once they develop them there, then they can sell them to farmers in Nebraska and Iowa and Illinois and everywhere else. So those things were going on at the same time. They were not interrelated. The papaya was not being funded by these companies. The companies, because they don't, papaya, is of, of marginal interest economically to these big companies. The money is in corn and soybeans. So what they're doing is the corn and soybeans over in Kauai and Maui. So those were, co those were coincidental, but they were not related. Yes. It's um, so upsetting to hear that when the companies challenged that law that <coughs> they won. And I just want to get your... Um, idea of why? Why does that happen? Why can't like the federal laws be better at protecting the people? Don't we have a right to know what our children are breathing in the air? It's just, I just want to get your idea on that. It's actually not complicated. Uh, I, I think in a way it's more dispiriting to understand why it happened, but it is not complicated. It actually comes simply down to a matter of money and power. So uh, I mentioned the Kauai story, the, the third story is, is on Maui. So Maui, around the time that this Kauai fight was going on, Maui was trying to pass a law to kick these companies off the island. 
They wanted to pass a law that said no GMOs. Not just tell us what you're spraying, but no GMOs. Now, you can imagine what the GMO corporations feared, because if, if you know, news stories break out that says an island has said, we want none of this, that the, fear, the fear would be that would be like a beginning of a snowball. And what happens if then California says no GMOs? Or what if you know, Canada says no, you know, whatever. If that thing rolls, then it's over for them. So the Kauai thing, the company's the first lost and then won. In Maui, they successfully passed a law, door to door, knocking on doors, getting signatures. They passed a law that kicked these companies off the island. The companies challenged that in court, and the same thing is going to happen. Two companies, Monsanto and Dow Chemical, put something like eight million dollars into a county ordinance to win to fight that battle. They were buying airtime, they were holding rallies, holding up banners, but you know, millions and millions of dollars from companies that were not based in Hawaii. They were based on the mainland, but they had farms in Hawaii, but they were terrified that this would become like the, the big poster child of the anti-GMO debate. So why would what kind of democracy can survive when you have a little county ordinance that has eight million dollars put in from outside to convince the people that live in that community to vote, in this case, against their own self-interest. Because the local community is not benefiting from this. So in other words, both of these are like these little microscopic uh, cases of democracy, democratic processes being radically influenced by big, powerful, highly financed corporations on one side and people on the other side. So when you ask why is it that these laws aren't protecting the people, the reason is, is that the laws are either written or enforced by politicians, government agencies that are themselves profoundly influenced by this money. So, you know, this is a big old can of worms, but, you know, one of the one of the reasons that people get so worked up about the Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, which allows companies to pour unlimited amounts of money into politics, is because those companies get an unbalanced amount of power in a political election. So if you have, for example, in Hawaii, you have one person who's running for office that's pro-GMO and one who's anti. And the pro-GMO guy is going to get, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars from corporations that want GMOs, and the anti-GMO guy's got to go door to door to collect nickels and dimes, who's going to win? So then this guy gets elected, and lots of other people like him gets elected, and suddenly you get laws passed that are pro-GMO, or pro-whatever it is, whatever the issue is. The, the people that get elected are paid for by the corporations that want certain kinds of laws passed, and lo and behold, they get those laws passed. This is not a secret. This is not doesn't, you don't need a PhD in political science to understand how this works. This is the way it works across all things. And the Citizens United thing is what has opened the floodgates to make this like worse by orders of magnitude because the money now is flowing in in you know, unprecedented levels. So this whole myth that one person, one vote, I mean, that hasn't been true for decades, if you want to think about it. So, you know, not to depress you, but that's, you know, you want to fix this, you got to fix money in politics. You got to have like an equal playing field. It's like that horse has left the barn a long time ago. Yeah. But back to what we can do in our own lives with our own families on the local level. Um, you're talking about buying from local farms. Sometimes that's easy if you get to the you know, if you can make it to the farmers market on the weekends and you get farms from the tri-state area and you will find organic produce there. But generally I find in the supermarket, you know, even the fancy ones, the organic produce is usually not from around here. And they will have local produce and I always want to buy local, but I have no idea how to evaluate right. whether that farm is using the worst chemicals. You know, I have read, um, um, what's his name, Pollen? Uh, yeah. Michael Pollen. I think it was just an interview, and he said something like, you know, there are people who sell, where he lives, there are people who sell, um, you, know, you know, spinach, let's say, that are not certified organic, but their stuff is better than the imported organic. But he doesn't say how he knows that. I mean, uh, you know, maybe he's actually gone to the farm. Is there a way to evaluate even inorganic local 
produce to be able to support these local growers, at least they're not industrial, at least they're smaller in size, um, so that we can eat well, eat reasonably, and also encourage uh, you know, a healthier uh, landscape. Uh, your question uh, reflects a lot of uncertainty about this. Like there's, it's so difficult to know what language to believe. So if you buy something that says natural on it, what does that mean? If you buy something that says organic, what does that mean? If you buy something that says non-GMO, I mean, all these labels become very potent symbols of something. Uh, just for the record, the word natural means nothing. Natural is a marketing term, not a legal term. The word organic means it was, it's a legal term that means it was grown with no synthetic petrochemicals, either fertilizers or sprays. So absolutely you should, whenever possible, you should buy organic because that is a, that is a, a term that is legally um, definitive. So now it may be true, it, it may be, I mean if you hear conspiracy theories all the time, maybe there are farmers that are putting an organic label on stuff that's not organic. If they do, theoretically they're breaking the law. So at least you can take some confidence that if it says organic, it probably actually is organic. If you go to a farmer and he says, I'm not organic, but I am what? Let's fill in the blank. Uh, one term that people are trying to come up with is sustainable. Like I've, in the book, I've got a, a profile of a woman on uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland who is not organic, but she cl says that I'm sustainable. She actually uses chemicals and she uses GMOs, but she says I'm sustainable. And sustainability is the goal, not organic. And I've heard other people say this too. Like, what if you had other things going on, like you planted cover crops and you reduced runoff and you um, nurtured your land in a way that was not just organic but broader than organic? It was also, it was not just about the chemical inputs, it was about your general practices. Shouldn't that be the goal? These are, this is the current state of the, the kind of the debate among small farmers. Like what in fact is the goal? Is the goal no chemicals or is the goal to to make your farm and your food as sustainable and as integrated as possible. So when you go up to your local farmer and he wants to sell you some spinach and he's not organic and you want to decide whether or not to buy this, it, it does come down to a, like a matter of trust. Like can you look this guy in the eye? The fact that you're looking a farmer in the eye at all is an important thing, which most of us don't get to do. And you know, you go there week after week and you can actually get to know, like, what are your practices? If he says, I'm not organic, you can ask him, like, so what is your philosophy of farming? and Why aren't you organic? And believe it or not, some farmers will give you a, a, a legitimate reason that they're not organic. Organic standards are expensive for local farmers. There are a lot of farmers, I know a number of them, that do not use chemicals, but don't call themselves organic because they don't want to do the paperwork. So it's complicated. I'm not saying this is simple, and it does require a certain amount of trust. It's, it requires a certain amount of education on the consumer's part. But I still think the default thing of going organic and going local is the best option when possible. And then as you get to know things better and better, you can uh, you know, cement your confidence by, t by knowing your farmer. Yeah, go ahead. I think there's another goal, you know, having listened to many of the speakers here at this conference, and um, this is really a very radical situation concerning all and the upcoming generation. And what I'm learning is that um, if we can't get the healthy foods from our local farms, we can actually create farms in our own homes and in our gardens. We can grow our own sprouts and our own microgreens in our own home. So sometimes it's going to take a radical move like that. And in doing that, we're not contributing to the problem. And then maybe the message will get out. Right. So the idea of growing your own food, uh, she calls it radical, right? So like in all of human history, how many generations of people didn't grow their own food? Like what, three? Everyone grew their own food forever and ever in all places. It's only now that that is seen, somehow seen as this crazy hippie idea. And that, that fact shows you how penetrating the mythology is. Like, I mean, not to sound too much like an English professor, but language is really important. Like, what do you call farms that use a lot of agricultural chemicals? You call them conventional farms. Conventional, that is to say, the norm, the normal farmer uses chemicals. 
they're not conventional in any way. The use of these agricultural chemicals is a tiny fraction of time in the history of agriculture. So to call, what we should call them is chemically dependent farms. An organic farm would be a hell of a lot closer to a conventional farm because they predated the use of these chemicals. So, you know, language is really important. When you call this radical and that conventional, you know, it's like a funhouse mirror. So it's important to keep your eye on that as well. Go ahead. Perhaps, um, I don't know, I was thinking that um, we also, like Steve uh, encourages every morning before we start the program, we are here to grow not only intellectually and, but also spiritually. So we have to remember the saying, no by bread alone. So just don't think about food since we woke up until we go to sleep. Think about something else. And sometimes, like someone told me who knows me close, he said, it's not what she eats, it's what, what she doesn't eat. Because I only eat when it's something nutrition available. Not when I am hungry or when I am want to have pleasure with something. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, her, her question or comment was about how, you know, f food and eating is or could be or should be part of your entire way of thinking about the world. Think about your spiritual place in the world, your emotional place in the world. And I think it was <clears throat> Michael Pollan who has this phrase in his book. He says, uh, what you want to eat is not just food that's good to eat. You want food that's good to think. And I really love that as a as a encapsulation of something. Like when you're putting something in your mouth, what this that thing has a whole story behind it. It has a story about the land it was grown on. It has a story about the people that grew it. It has a story about the politics that allowed it to be grown. About the federal subsidies or not federal subsidies. The whole. I mean, you know, the old Buddhist Zen expression is like, you know, you can you should be able to see the whole universe in a single drop of water. That actually is literally true, right? Because the whole thing, you know, this is what they, you know, everything is in fact stitched into everything else, including what we eat. So when you eat, you, there is a way to eat in a way that is compatible with a very, you know, spiritually integrated way of being in the world. And the fact that we don't eat that way is again a historical anomaly. Like cultures around the world throughout history, eating was a spiritual act. You know, if you think about you know, the cliche is like the, you know, the indigenous hunter who kills the deer or the caribou or the seal and then says a prayer over it and thanking the spirit of the animal for allowing to, you know, allowing it to go into their body. That's a spiritual act that is tied up with food. This is why the, the meat thing is the most grotesque version of this because we have stripped animals of anything except the fact that they have protein or something. So, I mean, I don't know if you look at that thing up there as a spiritual being, but it's, you know, there have been cultures that thought of corn as having spiritual energy, which of course it does. It's just that we have stripped meaning out of it. In fact, not to say something too broad, but we've stripped meaning out of almost everything, which, not to stretch the point, you know, uh, we are a, a culture that is, seems to be adrift from meaning, I mean, in all kinds of ways. I mean, my undergraduates tell me like almost every day about the epidemics of anxiety and depression and drug abuse and alcohol abuse and all the symptoms of a culture that is spiritually adrift. So, you know, how you think about what you put in your body is a part of that conversation, which is why to me, writing about food is also about writing about, I mean, we'll call it the humanities, it's writing about life. It's not, you can't separate. This is why I don't like to get hung up on just the, the, you know, the genetics of the question. It really is a question about the, how you function in the world. And eating is, is a big part of that. It's a very intimate uh, part of that. Well, if anybody would like a book uh, or a signature or something, I'd be happy to accommodate you. But I thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you.